Today we're going to look at a Cisco 7204 VXR router. The 7200 series VXR was released in 1998 as a performance and capability enhancement to the original 7200 series that came out in 1996. The VXR series was incredibly popular because of its flexibility, performance, and build quality. In fact, despite support ending for them nearly 10 years ago, a lot of these VXR routers are still out there running large networks today. We're going to get two of these big 7200 series routers talking over a T1 point-to-point -point connection. Then we'll set up a separate local network connected to each router with some real computers hooked up to them. And maybe we'll even do some gaming over that T1 link. I'm a complete amateur when it comes to this complex enterprise networking gear. So I'll bring you along as we figure out how to configure all that stuff. And as Dwight D. Eisenhower once said, it is entirely beyond my comprehension, but still capable of exciting my wonderment. Let's get into it. These are a pair of Cisco 7200 series routers. We'll be focusing in on this VXR unit on the bottom here today. Routers, very simply put, can take network traffic in on one physical connector, typically called an interface, and decide where it needs to be sent onto, typically another interface. For example, this top unit has a T1 card, so you'd have a T1 connection coming from your service provider, and this thing will allow, you know, Windows or whatever other machines to connect up to these Ethernet ports and access the internet over the T1 if you configure this properly. This VXR unit was generously donated by a viewer and patron named Brooke. So if you're watching Brooke, thank you very much. And I'm very proud to say I'm just the second owner. This was purchased back in the early 2000s and had a service life of over 20 years without missing a beat. And that's why people like these 7200 series routers so much. They're built like tanks. These things are like little boulders to pick up. And as we'll see, the modular architecture that Cisco came up with kept these things relevant for many, many years. On the top, I've got what I'll call an original 7200 series router. The 7200 series came out in 1996 and they upgraded to the VXR line in December of 1998. But as you can see, just by glancing at them, the pieces are largely interchangeable, though not all the boards work with the older model. To the best of my knowledge, Cisco documentation never mentions what VXR actually stands for. If you do a quick Google, you'll find an 18 year old Cisco forum post in which a Cisco employee claims it doesn't stand for anything. Other commenters on that forum post leave several other theories. Voice exchange router, voice extended router, versatile express routing. If you ask ChatGPT, what's the difference between the original Cisco 7200 series and the 7200 series VXR? It refers to it by yet another name, virtual extensible router. And then if you get straight up with it and ask directly what VXR stands for, it claims virtual executive resources. Google's Gemini takes the safe route and claims Cisco does not officially assign a specific meaning to VXR. So the jury is out on the official name, but unofficially many, and I'm not joking, many people would simply translate VXR as very expensive router. And there's a good reason. These were very expensive. As a really crude example, in 1998, the six slot version of this, this has four, just pretend it has six, the network processing engine 300. So this is basically the computer that this one does have. It's on the back. We'll look at that in a second. And just for fun, we'll throw in a token ring card. This setup in 1998-ish would have cost you about $30,000 list price. If we adjust that for inflation here in 2024, we're talking $57,000 for this setup. And in 1998, I'm guessing it probably didn't come with this guy, which has a couple of fast ethernet ports for you. And by the early 2000s, when this one was acquired, that would have been a pretty mundane setup. So the prices only go up from there. There's four main components you need to understand about these 7200 series of routers. So obviously we've got these modular interface things. These are called port adapters. They unlock and you can pull them out. They all have the same back connector, but what they're capable of is the difference. So this is one fast ethernet port and the model number comes from the amount of port adapters you have. So this one up here is a 7206 because it has six port adapters. This is a 7204 VXR. It's a VXR model and it only has four port adapters. Something quite interesting you'll see is Cisco went with the same chassis. These all connect up into what's called the mid plane, the second important component that we'll discuss. And I wonder if we poke our head in here and look around, did they use a shorter mid plane? It seems like that's the only way they would have cut costs and it must have been cheaper to just manufacture the same chassis, even though the VXR here is missing two of the ports. So we've got port adapters, we've got this mid plane that they connect into, and then we've got the IO controller, input output controller. These are used for connecting up to this router and configuring it typically over a serial interface. So I'm pretty happy to be messing with this VXR. 
on the older one, it only supports the older style serial connector. And so I got to convert that to USB and all that. Won't have to deal with that at all. I can just plug in my Cisco cable right here. We'll slide all these components out in more detail when we dive into this VXR unit. Talking about the mid plane again, you can kind of see the line where it is on these things. That's a PCB board sideways. The port adapters and the IO controller go into it that way. Power supplies and what's called the NPE or network processing engine come in this way. Let's talk about that. Quick side note, thinking about the chassis being the same. They did that because they want the power supply and the MPE to fit. So obviously this needs to be the same height so that these components can be interchangeable between the two, even if there's less ports on the front. The power supplies appear to be identical. Let's find out. Brooke sent along an extra one for me in case I get in trouble. It's got these thumb screws here. Really nice pull handle. Yeah, looking the same to me. Same voltages and everything. I mean, manufactured at different times, obviously, but same components. And then we have the network processing engine. This is basically the computer <laughs> for these routers. This is how everything gets done. This in combination with whether you're VXR or not dictates how capable the machine is. So the older one, I've got an MPE 200 and down here I've got an MPE 300. The 300, I think came out basically when the VXR line launched after they upgraded from the OG 7200, basically I think it's 50% faster than this guy. And the Cisco logo tells a story. This is obviously an older style logo than that one, which is maybe what they still use. Just got some thumb screws on the back. And at least in my experience, these can be quite difficult to get out sometimes, but maybe the weight of the unit on top will help us. Yeah, easier than usual. So this huge guy is the brains of the operation, the MPE 300. And as you might guess, these can be upgraded. As late as the mid 2000s, Cisco was coming out with the MPE G1 and G2. Introduced gigabit, way more memory. These VXR is maxed out with a G2 and modern port adapters are still very capable routers, especially if you're just talking about like home use or something. I mean, it's total overkill. An unfortunate reality of this design with the pull handle is that you can see this one is quite bent that direction, this one even worse. And so what happens, as you could imagine, it's very easy when you're maneuvering these things and they are quite heavy to put it down on its end like that. I mean, this could have happened during shipping to me, very likely, but yeah, that's too bad. And it'll happen to these guys too. It's really easy for these top ones to get banged up along with this bottom one. Again, not much of a complaint. Really, you wouldn't be racking these up over and over again or moving them around your basement like I do. But yeah, you just have to be careful with that. Just for posterity, I was curious if the mid plane actually had less connectors and this wasn't just some sort of blanking plate. Here's the 7206 on the left here. And of course it has six slots on its mid plane. And this one theoretically has four. And sure enough, I won't be able to show it on camera very well, but basically shined a flashlight through there and there are no extra connectors. So that makes sense which of course is how Cisco would do it because presumably this one was cheaper than a six port model. And so why would Cisco leave that on the mid plane? And there's a peek at the VXR's mid plane back in there, same connectors as the other 7200 series older routers. The VXR, the main update, I guess you could say is that mid plane is faster and has double the throughput. So the VXRs are just much more capable overall. Let's take a look at how our VXR is configured. So we've got the IO controller and it's got a console port for serial management. And then what's really nice about these, <laughs> I call them newer because my other one was that just simple serial interface you saw. They come with two fast ethernet ports that you can configure. And so that is nice, especially in a smaller unit like this, where I don't have to dedicate one to an adapter port like this. I can use these. They have two PC MCIA slots for these ATA flashcards. This one is 48 megabytes. So that's what came with the unit and you store iOS, the operating system images and configuration on here. Let's take it out. It's got the thumb screws. These are also very hard to get out. Pretty nice looking board. Got more of the Intel onboard flash. I'm seeing some 2008 codes on these very excellent orange Intel chips here. Let's get those cleaned off. Closer look at those bad boys. These IO controllers with the fast ethernet ports do not work in the older non VXR units I tried. So don't be like me and buy one thinking you could upgrade your 7206. It's not going to work. These are 7200-IO2FE 
E. So IO controllers with two fast Ethernet ports. The 7206 I got came with this Cisco branded Intel flash card, which is excellent. That's the iOS version that happens to be on this card. Super cool. As for our port adapters, we've got a two DS3 serial port adapter, basically two T3 lines, I think. So this would have either been the network coming in from the service provider, or you could use these as fast links between two routers or even two separate offices. And then the other port adapter is a fast ethernet card with either a media independent interface. So this is a 100 megabit ethernet interface just with a different form factor than you used to. I think Sun Machines in the mid to late 90s used it a lot. And then of course in RJ45, I have another one of these in the 7206. Speaking of these port adapters, I have been collecting quite a few. This is like really bad for me. This modularity and different variants of T1 and variants of T3 is like my kryptonite when it comes to collecting. These 7200 series are so flexible and they absolutely scratch a, a certain itch. So let's, let's take a look at the cards I've got. I have two full duplex token ring cards, which I definitely am going to get a network going with that. One of them doesn't work, makes the router reboot. And I've got this other one that I haven't tried out yet, and it's looking a little less sketchy. So that'll be exciting in a future video. I've got another multi-channel T1 PRI card. So we'll be able to hook up tons of T1 lines. And another multi-channel DSX1 PRI card. Got this serial V35 card. It's basically a very large connector that has eight serial lines going over it, and they can be variable speed. I have not personally tried this V35 card because I had this blown capacitor, but a bunch of viewers said that, yeah, probably not a problem. Like worst case scenario, one of these lines won't work. So once I get a connector, I'll definitely have to try that out. And then a multi-channel two T3 plus, so two T3 lines coming in. We might be able to use that with this guy once I have the right connectors. And the best part about all these variants is you get to discover stuff you've never even heard of. So this is an ATM card, asynchronous transfer mode. This was a competitor, if you will, to Ethernet in the 90s. You can run data, voice, all, you know, tons of stuff over this. And it's got these big fiber connectors. And you know I'm not letting that slow me down. ATM. Look at that. These 7200 series routers are amazing machines if you want to learn about a ton of different networking connections and types and historical uses represented here for relatively little money in the grand scheme of collecting old crap. We've got token ring, V35 serial, T3, T1, ATM, it's incredible. And the one machine can do it all depending on the port adapters you buy. And like I was saying, it's just fun to collect for. Like I know for sure, I'm gonna go find every T1 card this thing has, even though I don't need that. When I collect stuff, I'm a sucker for like sets or variants. So I used to do a bunch of NES collecting and a common one there would be, you'd have a five screw game, they're older and they figured out they could do plastic clips on the top and just use three screws and save money. So these are the same game. I don't need both, but whenever I came across a five screw or a three screw variant I didn't have, I kept them. Same deal with just slight label variants. So here we've got <laughs> Lee Trevino's fighting golf and you can see a black label here and then the white Nintendo seal of quality there. And so I noticed that, you know, I probably got these for nothing 10 years ago and I kept them both. And I was talking about all those T1 cards. I'm a sucker for sets, so like, <laughs> here's every Fisher Price game ever made for the NES. Do I play these? No. Did I collect them? Yes. The 7200 series is even better though, because you get to collect these port adapters and they can all do something different that if you're like me, you haven't interacted with. I don't know much about networking beyond ethernet. I really don't. Like when I hooked up T1 earlier to the other one, that was fascinating, and we'll definitely get some T1 going on this one. The idea is to get T1 going between this one and the other one. Not to mention, you can dive into what I would consider obscure, because I'm not in the networking industry, and I definitely wasn't doing this stuff in the 90s, like something like ATM. Speaking of ATM, I almost forgot to ask you, what would you do with a million dollars? Two port adapters at the same time. That's right, it's a double wide. Well, Cisco calls it dual width, which I don't think is as good of a name. This is an ATM CES card. I know it's got the ATM connector. T1's involved somehow. I'm not gonna pretend I even understand this thing at all, but I'm excited to dive in and get to know it. And how could you say no? It's two port adapters in one. Basically, 
this slot in here comes out and then you can load up one of these dual width adapters. It just has, of course, the same connector, two of them. Pretty fascinating. <laughs> this one's a little dingier than the eBay seller implied. Seems like there's been some uh, water around it. So hopefully it works. It was sold as working. But that'll be after we make sure this thing works in its original configuration it was shipped to me in, which I'm sure that it does. I, it was pulled from a working environment, but we'll boot it up once in this configuration and then we'll pull both of these. We'll use T3 in later videos and this fast ethernet. I don't need it because I've got two right here. We'll get the dual wide in there and probably a T1 card. We're going to hook it up to one of these Cisco cables. It's an RJ45 to serial adapter. They go by a few names. I call them Cisco cables. This one's Cisco branded or console cables, but there's a couple other names, rollover cable or Yoast cable for the guy that invented them, I guess. So we'll plug that into the console port. There's also this aux port. You can somehow dial into these, you know, like a modem and access them remotely that way somehow. So we'll have to figure that out someday. And then just for convenience, I use one of these RS-232, you know, serial to USB adapter cables. Some older equipment doesn't like running through this and you get weird behavior, but I've never had any trouble with Cisco gear. These do have a power switch on the back, which is easy to forget about and give yourself a heart attack. So don't forget that. The first power up in my possession. Let's see what happens. Fans are coming up. I see some light action. And right away, of course, stereo console comes to life. It looks like we've got 262 megabytes of memory on that NPE 300. This is the bootstrapping procedure or ROM coming up. Uh, I think it's seeing, I don't know what that means actually. Why would it be complaining about the fast ethernet cable so quickly? Okay, it's been wiped which is exactly what Brooke, the previous owner, had told me, so that's great. This is the auto install kind of setup that you get if you haven't configured the routers before. I, I never use it, I, I always do it by hand with the with the commands, which we'll, we'll set up in a second. This is the version of iOS it thinks it's gonna use, which should theoretically be on that flash card. Let's see what it does. I do see the activity light on the flash card, so we'll give it some time. So I think it tried to load from boot flash. So it's got a flashed version of the OS. And also you can load from the cards I was showing you. So I, th I think that's what it's trying to do now. We'll see. We are in at the router prompt. Let's do enable, no password. That's perfect. Let's take a look at show IP interface brief. And we have our three ethernet interfaces and two serial. T1, T3 interfaces, those are called serial interfaces. Perfect. This thing's working just fine. Well, let's get it into the physical configuration I wanted it. No surprises there. Good news nonetheless. So the immediate plans for this are we're going to get a T1 card in there. This guy right here. And then we're going to get the dual width board in there. We probably won't use it today, but I just want to know if it works. And it's going to live in here anyway. This dual width board has 1997 copyright codes and it's called the alien port adapter. <laughs> so that's good. You saw in the config, it recognized all three fast ethernet connections. So we don't need this one and we don't need this T3 card for now. We will revisit this someday and we'll put this right here. This is our T1 PRI card. Pull out our blanking plates. I guess I just need to put one right back in. Okay, that's looking good. And I was reading in the instructions, there is a, some sort of maneuver you make to get this thing out of here. There's a little tab right here, which theoretically I can lift and <laughs> the instructions make it seem like it's gonna be pretty easy, but it doesn't seem like it. I think I got it, just needed to lift it a little more. Oh yeah, look at that. Did you know that that was possible? Here's that little tab. So it locks in and you lift it up like that. And yeah, it just comes right out. So looking forward to losing this. And then the ATM CES card goes right in. That looks awesome. All of the fiber optic cards have this laser warning, this yellow stripe, and they kind of put it to the side. You know, some, some design went into that. And I think the port adapters with that looks so cool in these things. This is gonna be so good whenever I get around 
to learning ATM. Just look at that. Speaking of ATM, I was searching VXR YouTube videos as I was kind of ramping up to, you know, thinking about making this one. And there's a YouTuber, KJ7BZC, and they've got a really cool video involving a VXR, an ATM link to a DSLAM, and they're using modems to connect up to the whole thing. And it's really cool. And I was sitting there a few days ago enjoying the video and the VXR shows up and I was like, yeah, bitchin' VXR. And he goes, oh yeah, I got this VXR because I saw it in Clab Retro's other video. <laughs> and I was like, wow. <laughs> anyway, if you're at all interested in what's going on here, I'll link to that video in the description. It's great. So this is our configuration for today. We've got this ATM CES card. I just want to make sure that works. It will live here though. I kind of like it there. And then we've got a T1 card. What we're going to do is get T1 on this one working and connect it up to that 7206 I was just showing you. But the future for this one is I want to get a beefier NPE, Network Processing Engine, a G1. So they came out with MPE G1 and G2 later on. And you might be asking, you know, why not go right to the G2? And well, it's our lucky day. This just showed up in the mail. Inside that box was this Cisco 7201. This is a much more modern offering in the 7200 series line, of course. But check this out, it's got a port adapter. So yeah, part of the same series, they carried the modularity forward into these gigabit capable routers. I'm really excited to dive into this one sometime. And you know, maybe we'll make it run a uh, token ring network with all that power behind it. <laughs> this was very generously donated by a viewer named Tony all the way from Sweden. So thank you, I'm really, really happy to have this. And their company, Sinotio, I hope I'm saying that right, was kind enough to pay for shipping. They were the original owners of that router, so thank you very much. And I bring this up because this is essentially, performance-wise, an MPE G2 that you could put in one of these. So to sort of round out the fleet, so to speak, I'm gonna get, I have a G1 on the way from eBay, actually, for this one. So we'll get a G1 in here, a G2 in here. There's a lot more, there's MPE 400 and 250 and all sorts of fun stuff to collect. So this will be the powerhouse of my 7200 units. <laughs> I don't know when it originally came out, but this one was manufactured March of 2011. And here's a perfect example of what I was talking about earlier with these handles. It got totally mangled uh, during shipping in, a, in its past life. Not to me. It was packaged very well for me, but the original owner warned me about that. And of course, that's no problem down here. Restored back to its original glory. One last interesting aspect about when I upgrade this to the bigger MPE, the MPE G1, it takes over as the IO controller. So the console access and everything is actually on the back once you put that card in, and this one needs to come out. And what that means is we have this big open slot here, and Cisco actually made something called a port adapter jacket card. Basically it plugs in here and gives you one more port adapter where the IO controller used to go. And so that's perfect for this 7204, which doesn't have a lot of port adapters, I'll get a fifth one once I hunt down one of those. So that's part of the plan too. But back to the task at hand, we're gonna get a T1 connection going from the VXR to the 7206. That'll be easy and get them pinging back and forth over this line. But then we'll get an ethernet network with some computers on this one, a computer on this one coming out over one of these fast ethernet ports and see if we can get them talking to each other. That's gonna be real fun. She's having a little trouble. Rebooted by Watchdog Hard Reset. Kind of looping a little bit. Doesn't like that ATM CES board. We get a bad 1575 shutting down Bay 4, which is the right side. I can get to here, say no. This just hangs and then it reboots. So we'll pull the big card out. I also need to do something about the monitor NVRAM area being corrupt. <laughs> Here it goes, pulled that big card out and it knows about our eight port T1 card. That's good. I think it is booting up. Well, it booted up with just the T1 card. It seems happy with it. If we do show IP interface brief, you'll see it does know about the fast ethernet ports on the IO controller, but it doesn't know anything about our serial connections or our T1 connections. So we can do a show run and we have these T1 controller things. Controller T1 one slash zero just means port adapter slot one, interface zero. That's what I have my cable plugged into. So we're gonna wanna configure this first T1 controller. So let's get into configure terminal, and then we can configure the controller we care about. We have to set a few things that are T1 related. They have to be the same on both ends, on either end of the router. I'm gonna do that real quick. All right, got that done. So now if we do show IP interface 
we see this serial one, zero. So that's our T1 port. We're gonna give this thing an IP. So now that we know the interface name, we can go interface serial one, zero, zero. And we're configuring it right now. I don't think you would usually build a network like this with this subnet mask for T1, but I'm just doing whatever works for me. Now, if we show the IPs, we have serial 100 with 10.003 assigned. That's perfect. We've got one last thing to do. So let's issue a show controllers T110, the one we're configuring, and it'll spit out all the information. This is how I've got it set up. And it says clock source is line. Now you either have clock source internal or line. And when you're doing this crossover stuff between two routers like I am, they need to be different on either end. I already set up the 7206 in a different video for T1, and I know it already has its clock source as line, so we're going to set this one to something else. So if I remember correctly, we go configure our controller, and it should have a clock source command we can set. So we'll say clock source internal. Let's take a look at our controller now, and it is indeed clock source internal with an IP of 10.003. We should theoretically be able to hook these routers up now. Just plugged in the 7206, have it going to another USB to serial converter. We'll let this thing boot up and see if they can talk to each other. It has an older version of the bootstrap hardware and it doesn't, doesn't understand its T1 card initially, but when iOS boots up, not a problem at all. I apparently did not write my configuration out when I set that up. So let's do that same thing over again. I'm almost positive I wrote out my config last time, <laughs> but that's okay, I guess. If we take a look at our IPs, the serial port on the 7206 is 10.001. They both say they're down because that is not a T1 cable. One second. T1 only uses four wires, and that is not what I plugged into these things. So what we should see is some link lights come on now. Top one is up. Bottom one is also up. <laughs> okay. I am on the 7206 right now. If I ping the VXR, they are talking to each other over T1. Excellent. Here's the VXR. You can see these automated messages about the lines coming up and stuff. We can ping 10.0.0.1. And of course, 100% success rate. Now we're going to set up networks on some of the fast Ethernet ports. Here's the network I want to set up. We've got the 7206 on the left and the VXR we're looking at on the right. You just saw they're hooked up over a T1 connection here between one another. That's working fine. They can ping each other. We're going to have a network coming off 7206. We'll make it 192.168.3. That's me sitting there connected to it on a computer. This will be over one of the Ethernet ports. Maybe we'll have a switch in there, not sure. On the VXR, we'll have another network with a computer hooked up to it. And basically, I'm going to sit down like this guy and do some serious gaming across this T1 line to some server over here. And this is going to be our server. The Compact ProLiant DL380 Gen 1. This thing's running Windows 2000. And I can't think of a better use than installing Counter-Strike 1.5 on it. Setting that up as a server, we'll throw it and the VXR in another room. I'll make a longer T1 cable. Then we'll get this Windows XP machine set up in here, hooked up to the 7206 over the Ethernet interface here. And then I can sit down and do some real gaming over a T1 link from the comforts of home. So I was researching and experimenting off camera with the 7206 to figure out the best way to do this. And I thought, well, I'll set it up as a DHCP server so that when this guy connects, he gets an IP, and it'll be in the 192.168.3 subnet. And it just kind of worked. <laughs> Wasn't a lot of commands, just started working. So this is a Windows XP machine. I have this plugged in directly to the Ethernet port that I configured with DHCP. And I have it configured to obtain IP address automatically. We come over here to IP config. It got assigned a .3.2 which is what that router should be doing. I can ping the router. And then 
over on the 7206. If I ask it what it knows about the DHCP stuff it's handed out, sure enough, <laughs> that's my Windows XP VM networking. That went way too well. So I wonder what horrors await us trying to get those two networks talking to each other over the T1 link. Obviously, I need to set up the same situation on the VXR, so I'll show you what I did. It's the next evening. I'm feeling fresh. Let's get this network configured. The Compaq and the VXR are over on top of the rack. The Compaq's NIC is plugged directly into one of the fast Ethernet ports on the VXR's I.O. controller on the front. I've also got a KVM connection set up on the Compaq so I can access it in the room I'm sitting in right now. And of course, we have the serial connection on the VXR connected to an MRV console server which will let me access that serial port over my network via Telnet. So the first order of business is we want that Ethernet port on this 192.168.4 network. So let's get that configured first. Here I am Telneted in to that secure console server, which lets me access that physical serial port over my network, which is pretty cool. Let's refresh ourselves on the interfaces here. So of course we have our T1 connection. And what we want to do is configure our first, so to speak, fast Ethernet port. So we'll do conf t, we'll say interface fast ethernet 00. I want it on 192.168.4.1. And let's bring it up. And we can see automatically we're getting these messages about that thing coming up. So that's all we have to do there. Let's get this thing set up as a DHCP server and it'll serve IPs automatically on that interface. First thing we do is configure terminal and we say IP routing. So we tell this router to start doing routing. Then we will make a DHCP pool and we have to give it a name. I'll call it Cloud Retro. When we're configuring the pool, we tell it which networks it should be associated with. So we say network 192.168.4.0. Then we want to exclude the DHCP server from handing out the IP we gave our interface, our gateway interface. That looks like this. Remember we called it 4.1. Helps if you spell it right. There we go. And that's kind of it. Let's pull up that compact. It is running Windows 2000. It's set up to obtain an IP address automatically. So let me double check everything and make sure we're good to go. It doesn't think it's connected. Okay, so when I set up the 7206, I plugged a direct, direct cable in. I think you need a crossover cable. So something called MDIX took place, I think, in my, in my case, either in software. Long story short, the the device has figured out that they needed to virtually switch some pins and that's not what's going on here. So let's get a switch hooked up. Obviously we'll be using this little thing. It's even technically Cisco equipment. We're liking what we're seeing. Check that out. Yeah, we just needed a switch in the situation or a crossover cable, which I don't have. So put that switch in. You saw the lights were blinking away, worked right away. And this machine was issued 192.168.4.2. So now we have this situation. We have this situation and the two routers can talk to each other. As a side note, I realize it's kind of funny to have a slash 24 subnet on this class A 10 dot whatever IP. If you don't know what that means, long story short, I, I, it's divided into more pieces than it needs to be, but it doesn't matter. And uh, all you need to know is I'm an amateur, but I think it'll work. Now the left side doesn't know how to talk to the right side. We need to tell these routers to do some routing. And the way we're going to do that is with RIP or routing information protocol. RIP is a dynamic routing protocol that you can configure on these guys and you can tell them, hey, all your interfaces with these networks advertise that you know how to get there. And then these guys are gonna start talking to each other every 30 seconds and say, hey, the 7206 is gonna say, I know how to get from 10.0 to 192.168.3. The VXR is gonna say, well, I know how to get from 10.0 to 192.168.4 and that way traffic can flow from my little guy on the left here to the compact. The only thing you really need to know about RIP is that you probably shouldn't use it. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty old protocol. It has a bunch of speed limitations. It, it's okay in this like sort of lab environment like we're setting up here. It has a maximum hop of 15 routers. So the moment your network has more than 15 routers to get across you know, one network to the other, it's just not going to work, literally won't work. So yeah, there's more modern protocols, but I've never used this RIP thing before. Looks pretty simple to set up, which is, I'm all about simple to set up down here. Uh, so let's try it out. This should be interesting. Never done it before. So configure terminal. We're going to say router RIP. 
And we always want version two. Version one sucks, I guess. That's what I heard. We want no auto summary to avoid a bunch of funny business. And then we tell it which networks to route and worry about and advertise for RIP. So we say network 10.0.0.0. This is our T1 connection between the routers. We say network, I think we set up dot four on this one. In practice, if you were in a production environment, you would uh, tell the other ports that aren't the T1 link to not broadcast RIP to each other. And But anyway, I'm just down here. For today, show. Okay, Cisco folks that have done this a lot. Is it annoying when you're typing commands and stuff and the router spits out these automatic messages and then you have to press enter? I mean, you could keep typing, but it breaks up your command. Isn't that frustrating? Maybe in practice, you wouldn't really be doing this on a live router and or you'd be programmatically applying the scripts. I don't know, let me know. Show IP protocols. What do we got? Check this out. We've got rip every 30 seconds. It's gonna broadcast out and try to find other rippers. <laughs> and we are routing for any interface that's on these networks. So you don't really worry about the interface. You just say, you know, any any interface that's dealing with these networks, broadcast it out because I know how to get to them and you can let other routers know that. Okay, I am gonna fire up the 7206. We're gonna get that Windows XP machine hooked up to it. I'll perform all this same rip stuff on that guy. And that setup should allow us to ping between the XP machine I was showing you and our ProLiant. I forgot I need to make a longer T1 cable. This is 30 feet, so I'll cut off the ends and sacrifice that one. Check out my sweet gaming setup. I'm gonna play like 12 whole minutes of Counter-Strike against some bots here. Sometimes, you know, Sometimes you just gotta hook some computers up. Whew, those are a pain because you need a one pin gap between the two pairs and it's kind of hard to get them in there. But we are good to go. Got that ran into the other room. Link lights are on, on the VXR and in here on the 7206. Started putting these red tags on them because I'm losing track of which <laughs> cables are T1 cables and it's easy to make the mistake and then waste 30 minutes trying to figure out what you configured wrong on the router. And it only took me one recrimp to get this cable to work. I'm also realizing we're gonna need a switch on this side of the equation as well, but that won't be a problem. We are so close. This is the 7206, the one in the room with me. Remember, this represents the left side of our diagram. So if we do show IP interface brief, remember we are attempting to host a 192.168.3 network. And if we say show IP protocols, it knows about the distant router. RIP has somehow informed this thing about the VXR. This is the VXR over that T1 link I was showing you in that diagram. So what this means, is even though I'm on the router that has the dot three interface, I should be able to ping the other router and I can. So we have some routing going on. Unfortunately, this is the VXR and I just issued a show IP protocols. It doesn't know about the other router. And remember, I'm, now I'm on the right side of our diagram, the dot four network, and I cannot ping the other router. So. Hopefully I just missed something. We are so close. <laughs> okay, so I'm messing around, <laughs> changing the serial links, subnet and everything. Uh, and I'm pretty sure it's because there's no device on the other end. Didn't actually have anything plugged into our interface here. So this guy's up and blinking away. That's good. And as we might expect, we were served up a .3.2 address. So we're looking good. And now on the VXR, if we issue show IP protocols, it sees the other router. We can do show IP route. It's saying, I know how to get to 192.168.3 via RIP. That's what that means. And it knows it's going through the other router. I should be able to ping that interface. I can. We're getting very close. The routers can ping each other, but if I try to ping the Compaq from this XP machine, nothing. So probably some more configuration needs to happen on the routers. I'm gonna do some research. The machines are not getting a default gateway, so they can't 
ping out. So obviously here on the compact on Windows 2000, we were assigned an IP from the DHCP server, but we don't have a default gateway. And that is of course, because I did not configure my DHCP pool to provide a default gateway. <laughs> So let's try that. I am editing my Club Retro Pool on the VXR, the one that's with the Compaq, and I can say default router 192.168. This is our .4 network. Let's see if that makes any difference. Remember IP config release and renew on Windows. Oh, look at that. It worked. We have a default gateway. This should mean on my .4 network, I'm on the, you're looking at the Compaq right now, I should be able to ping the Windows XP machine which I believe is 3.2. So close, so close. Like unbelievably close. <laughs> Here's the Windows XP machine. I can ping the compact. I can go one direction, we're so, we're so close. Here's a clue. This is the 7206, the router that's in here with me, making all this noise, connected to the Windows XP machine. It can ping the compact connected to the other router, but it can't ping the Windows XP machine connected to it on one of its interfaces. So something funny with the config here or the XP machine maybe. It was the Windows XP firewall settings. <laughs> Never doubting my Cisco iOS abilities ever again. Which means our network here is fully operational. We've got a disparate LAN here, one over here. They are connected by the Collab Retro Enterprises T1 point to point. Cisco 7200 router setup. Uh, let's get some Counter-Strike going, I guess. I have been withholding some information from you. These things have not been persisting their configs when I turn them off, this one or the VXR. I've been using write memory, WR. It seems happy with that, but the configs are gone when I restart. Now, I think it might be as simple as issuing a copy run start to for sure get the running configuration into the start configuration. I haven't had the time to peruse the pretty involved decision tree these things take when they start up to figure that out. And also I might mess that up as I'm experimenting. And so this is a pretty good opportunity to figure out how to copy the running config to another machine. In order to do that, you use the copy command again. You can copy the running config to a TFTP server of your choice. I have a TFTP server running on my home 192.168.1 network here in the rack. But of course, these routers are totally segregated from that one. What we're gonna do is hook up the open fast ethernet port of this VXR to my network here on the Ubiquiti switch and see if we can get it talking to that TFTP server. That port you just saw me plug that ethernet cable into, I've configured with a 192.168.1 address. So it should be able to talk to my network in the rack. We can try pinging my TFTP server, which is running in a VM in Proxmox. When it always surprises me when I ping that TFTP server. The success rate seems like it's always like 80%. That's pretty on par for that guy. That's fine. So what we can do is copy the running config from this VXR router over TFTP to a server of our choice. So we can type in my .82 machine. We'll call it VXR config. It's done. Here we are SSH'd into the VM hosting that TFTP server on the 192.168.1 network. And if we LS the folder it's serving up, sure enough, we see a bunch of other Cisco bins. VXR config. And at the end of the day, that is just a text file with the config of the router. I can ingest this into a router of my choice and it'll apply this config. So this is kind of a nice peace of mind. I'll tell you what, I was getting really good at configuring these T1 controllers from memory. Won't have to do that anymore. So we've got the VXR backed up. That was surprisingly easy, but I'm out of fast ethernet ports on this guy. Now I have four over here, but these are 10 bit. I don't even know if my router supports that. I've got this one, I could reconfigure it. I've got another one of these port adapters. I could slide that in. And so I was thinking about what to do here because I need to get this on the 192.168.1 network. And then I realized we can just use our newfound RIP knowledge. I'm back on the VXR over here, configuring the RIP. And all I need to do is add my 192.168.1 network. And theoretically, this thing should start broadcasting to the other one over T1 and say, hey, I know how to get to the TFTP server. And before I could even pull up the terminal window on the 7206, if I do a show IP route, it already knows that it can get to 192.168.1. Let's ping the TFTP server. Not going well. 
Eh, this might be beyond my uh, networking prowess at the moment. Probably something to do with getting these guys connected to yet another router that's doing NAT and stuff like that. So, can't ping, but I'll show you what I can do. Something called online insertion and removal. These port adapters are hot swappable. I've got, I've got another Ethernet one. Uh, theoretically, I can just slide this in quickly. Slide it in quickly. There we go. Whoa, enable light is on. Let's go check it out. Oh yeah, it sees it. We have a fast Ethernet 6.0. What a roller coaster. Let's configure that bad boy. Let's get it on the network here. Bring it up. Uh, there is no cable in it, so I'm going to plug it into my router real quick. Running out of Ethernet cords. Almost used it. This is a T1 cable. <laughs> I'm glad I started marking them. Duplex mix match. That's probably fine. Maybe. We can hit my TFTP server with our customary 80% success rate. So let's do a copy running config. We'll call this 2600 config. Done. Here it is on the TFTP server. Feeling good. I'm really happy about this. Uh, now, if I have to turn them off, not that big of a deal. And at the end of the video, I'll let you know if this copy run start works. Uh, I think that's what I want. I'm not going to turn them off in the meantime, though. No. They made it 25 years already. They can make it another two days. Believe it or not, you're looking at Counter-Strike running on that compact ProLiant. And this will be a walk down memory lane. The pre-Steam days, if you weren't there or you forgot how bad it was, you would install Half-Life. And then Counter-Strike was a free mod upgrade that you would download. You'd have to go find the right one, install that, and then finally you could launch Counter-Strike. And I'm experiencing a really classic problem where I try to launch the Counter-Strike server and it just crashes, complaining about DLLs. And this was pretty common. So what this probably means is the version of Half-Life I have is either too new or too old for the version of the Counter-Strike mod I downloaded. And it's just such a headache, <laughs> really bringing me back. So we'll do the next best thing and we'll fire up a Half-Life server on the compact. And then here we are over on the Windows XP machine, fire up Half-Life. My capture setup doesn't have sound. I'm so sorry, but this will be brief. So going over to multiplayer and we'll go to LAN game. And here is another absolute classic from back in the day. You and your buddies are trying to have a LAN situation going and none of the games ever show up <laughs> in the list. This one is probably because I'm on different subnets. So you remember our, our network architecture. So what you can do is on the beginning screen here, you can go to console. Now I'm in the console and I can connect directly to a server. So my compact is 192.168.4.2 and I'm sure everyone remembers the classic default Counter-Strike port. Connection accepted. That's the compact talking back. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with the, the size. Ooh, that's a bad idea. But that's okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Playing Half-Life multiplayer on my Cisco 7200 series routers. Over a T1 link in my basement, folks. This is making me so much more happy <laughs> it should. <laughs> it works. I, I think if you can play Half-Life or get Counter-Strike installed correctly, which used to take a PhD, you have a real network going, a real point-to-point -point network. <laughs> this is so good. I just power cycle both of these and they lost their configs or they're just not loading properly at boot. So our copy run start command that we ran wasn't enough. Like I said earlier, there is a lot of documentation about how to configure these things. They've got these configuration registers that you need to get right. I think the machines are fine. I just need to sit down and pour over that documentation and get them in the right state. Speaking of administrative work, this VXR appears to be running like a development version of the bootloader. It's got MVRAM complaints. So definitely some more admin work to do on this one. And this ATM CES card, I think it's the same story. I probably don't have a version of something on here that understands this thing. So always more work to be done. But I learned an absolute ton about basic networking concepts in this video. I had a really good time hooking these up, getting the setup pretty involved with all the cables going everywhere. Super fun. And a huge thanks 
to Brooke for donating the VXR and Tony for donating the 7201. If you like these types of videos, please consider subscribing. As I alluded to earlier, I've got plenty of admin work to do on these things. We're going to have to upgrade to T3 eventually. And I've got plenty of era appropriate servers that I'd like to play with and hook up to these things. And if you'd really like to support the channel, I'm on Patreon. I'm doing behind the scenes type videos, early release. You get a sneak peek about what I'm thinking about, what I'm doing. And I've also got a little bit of a basement remodel going. But I hope you enjoyed following along as I stumbled through this. I've got more videos on the way, and I hope I see you in the next one.